Hi, this is Professor Ellis with Technical Writing, English 2575, uh, Fall 2021, uh, for sections OL68 and OL70. Uh, this is week nine. We are flying through the semester at this point. Uh, I think we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And with that end in sight, I hope you are all doing well, that your families are healthy and safe as well. Um, I think we can get this thing um, in the can and completed successfully uh, together. So before we get into what we need to talk about this week, let me just remind you all uh, about my contact information and also make an announcement. Um, remember, you can always email me at jellis at citytech.cuny.edu uh, anytime, and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can, whatever questions or comments you have. Uh, but this week, because I'm going to be on campus for some important in-person meetings. I'm canceling Wednesday's office hours. That's just this week. Um, so if you've got uh, something you need to talk with me about, try to use email rather than um, us meeting in person. But if there's something important we should talk about that can't wait until next week, um, send me an email with your availability so that we can set up an alternate office hour meeting time. Uh, that's perfectly fine if we need to do that, but if it's not like you know, a pressing emergency situation, let's just save it for um, office hours on Wednesday next week uh, when things will be back to normal, Wednesdays 3 to 5 p.m. on Google Hangouts. Um, but whatever we need to do, you know, that's what I'm here for. We'll make it happen. So just reach out to me if uh, you need to talk to me about something. So for week nine, uh, let's review very briefly what we did last week and look at what we're going to take a look at this week. Uh, so last week we continued the instruction manual project. Uh, we talked about uh, ethics and technical writing. Uh, talked about plagiarism, self-plagiarism, um, how you know how and why we should avoid these things. And then we had uh, a little bit of talk about homework, which you're continuing with your instruction manual. We we're looking at those other parts of the instruction manual that needed to go into it. And then the weekly writing assignment uh, was strategizing about those other sections so that you're thinking about what you need to include in your finalized instruction manual. So this week I want to have a very short lecture uh, because I want to uh, do a couple of things with this week. I want to help you get done with a draft of your instruction manual. Um, I want to show you some other way, uh, other databases uh, that you can use for your research. Uh, like if you do need to, like you know, talk a little bit about maybe the company involved in what you're creating instructions about. Uh, for example, I, I touched on this last week, but I just want to make sure that you all know how to find those things through the library's website. Um, and again, using IEEE uh, style for all of our citations, in-text citations, and the references list at the end. Um, where we'll take a look at the final thing we need to add to your instructions that you've been creating on Google Docs. You know, we talked about that way back at week six when we started setting things up. Uh, because when you turn in your instruction manual, you're going to publish your instruction manual as a website using Google Docs. Uh, and then linking to it uh, from our Open Lab course site. So you're going to get a lot of practice with using some of these web technologies that are built into Google Docs and WordPress, which is what Open Lab is built on. So again, giving you some more practical experience that you can put on your resume. Um, so we're going to finalize the instruction manual. The last thing you need to add, which is going to be the cover page. And then we will... Um, just to give you a heads up, we'll talk about peer review next week. Uh, another thing I, I failed to, to list here is that I'm going to be looking at the team assignments before next week. And so I'm actually going to be reassigning teams um, based on uh, those folks that are actually participating in the class. Um, not to mean that anybody that's not participating will be completely excluded but I want to make sure that the teams are balanced and have uh, at least a few core individuals who are actively engaged in the class and doing the work. So I'll be looking back at, at both the weekly writing assignments and the major projects that have been turned in so far to see 
you know, who's actually participating and who's not. Um, now, your team may have one or two people that, that may not be as engaged. Um, their grade will, will reflect that. Okay, I don't want anybody to think that someone's getting a free ride on the team project we're going to begin working on next week. Um, because if someone's not participating, obviously they're not going to get a pass on that. Um, but those folks that are participating, obviously, will be earning that grade. Um, and we'll talk more about that next week. But do expect um, that next week I'll be sending out emails that define uh, the new teams. And we're going to use those new teams for peer review of the instruction manual and also for the team-based project. So I know it may cause a little bit of upheaval and, um, you know, people you may already have spoken with or worked with on previous peer reviews, but I do want to keep the class as fair as possible for the majority of students. And that's going to involve you know, moving some folks around to make sure we have good teams. And you do want a good team as we're going into the team-based project because um, you know, obviously that makes it successful or not if you have people to work with um, on that. So I'll, I'll be you know, sending those out and talking about that in next week's lecture. Right now I want us to focus on completing the instruction manual, at least the draft, uh, so that you can do peer review next week and get it turned in um, as soon as possible while you continue working on the team-based project that we'll talk about next week. And also, just to let everybody know, um, just to zip over to the syllabus. Here I'm on the OL68 um, site, same for OL70. Go to the syllabus. Even though we're at week nine, I don't want anyone to think that we are uh, running behind because we are going to... Um, have extra time when everything comes due that you can take advantage of and this is something that you not only for your individual projects but it's also true for the team projects so with week nine we're going to complete the instruction manual and we're going to push the introduce collaboration projects to week 10 then with week 10 we're going to peer review the instruction manual in your in the potential potentially new team that you will be working with uh, and while you're doing that you'll begin working on the collaboration projects that's week 10 11 12 13 14 and 15. now even though this is when i'm showing that um, the collaborative project post is going to be due you have one of those due per team that's going to include every part of the project that you're doing collaboratively. But, as you can see here, even though it's week 15, December 15, coincidence, um, the last day that I can receive work is Tuesday, December 21st. So even though we're, this is when things are technically due, I'll still be receiving work up until the 21st. I can't do it any later than that. I have to grade and get grades in before Christmas. But December 21st is the last day, the end of day, um, that I'll be able to receive your work. And so if you need to push things back, I will still be accepting your work and giving you full credit that you earn on that, uh, even if it's late. Okay. Now, with that being said, um, let's take a look at some of these things that we need to look at for the instruction manual. And... Uh, let you guys get to it. Okay, so the first thing I want to look at with the instruction manual is here on Google Docs where we've look, looked at before week six where we kind of set up the the basic outline for the project and uh, there's a couple of things that we can do here. So first off uh, with each of these different headings that we're using in our document. I want to show you something that's really cool with um, Google Docs that I want you to do. But before we do that, uh, if I'm at the top of my document, so like here you see the cursor is blinking and I'm on the very first line. 
I was going to hit return a couple of times, move that down, and then I'm going to go back up to the top. And this is this space is where we're going to be putting in our cover page for or your your cover page for your instruction manual. So with the cursor at the very first bit of content, your first heading for your instruction manual, what I want you to do first is click on the insert menu and then go down to break and choose page break. Okay, insert, break, page break. Now what this does is it moves your content down to the top of the second page or the following page or wherever you happen to be at in your document and creates a fresh page where we can put in something new. Now what's really cool about doing page breaks is that you can enter text over this entire page. So I can enter, 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 enter. And as you notice, I, I've gone down the page, right? Well, if you're normally like using a word processor, you would think any of those returns that you've entered on an earlier page will be moving your content down on the following pages. Well, if we scroll down, look, everything is still at the top of the following page. That's because a page break separates what's going on the page before from what's on the page following it. Um, so as long as you don't go over what's on this first page, it'll never affect the this, this second page. But now if you go over the content on this first page, it basically adds a fresh blank page before um, what follows the original content. So but we're not going to be doing that. We're just going to be working on this particular page. And so what we want to do is create a um, cover page for your instruction manual. This is like the first page, like if you were to print this out, this will be the first thing that your audience sees. And so let's go ahead and type in some content for this. Uh, let's give your instruction manual a title. Okay, so let's, I'm gonna type in for mine, instruction manual for assembling a skateboard, right? One of the things that we, we looked at before. Now, right now, I actually have that text set to bold, so I'm going to unbold that, which so is back to normal text. Okay. Then I'm going to skip uh, maybe just one line, and then I'm going to put my name. But what I want you to put is your name. Okay. Your name, right? So I'm going to just type in my name, Jason Ellis. Or just so there's no confusion, I'll, I'll make up a name. Very sell them if you happen to be watching Foundation or have read the books by Isaac Asimov. Now directly underneath your name I want you to write in your affiliation. When someone says what's your affiliation that means you know, where you work or like you where you go to school and for our purposes is where you go to school so we want to type in the full name of our school. New York City College of Technology, comma, capital C U N Y, CUNY. Now, while we're up here, let me just skip a couple, add a couple lines there. Let's do some work on this. First off, select that text, and then let's use the alignment tool in Google Docs and change that to center this icon here, center alignment. Then let's select the text for instruction manual for assembling a skateboard and let's change that from here it says normal text, let's change that to title. Okay, and That automatically sets the size larger to the largest heading size which is for the title. We're going to leave this text uh, underneath your, your name and affiliation to default. So like in this case, it's you know, Arial size 11. Now, in your instruction manual, you may have been playing around with the font and the font size, uh, but one thing to keep in mind uh, is the KISS principle. Keep it simple and stupid. Uh, and in this case, we want to you know, avoid using 
many different fonts and many different font sizes. We want consistency. Um, and so I would recommend sticking with a single font or font family, in this, excuse me, in this case, Arial, uh, for your instruction manual. But what we're going to look at in a second uh, are using headers or changing the, the heading style for what follows in your instruction manual. Now, after we've got this toward the top of you, know, the, the, the middle third of the page, and if I zoom out, then I'll, we can look at it a little bit easier. How about, oops, ah, there we go. So I think that looks about where I want that. I don't want it directly in the middle. I want it a little above the middle in that top third part of the page. Maybe I'm going to go back one more line. There we go. I think that's good. Now what I'm going to do is press enter so I go down toward the bottom of the page. Okay, I went over. See, I went to the second page. So I'm going to backspace one time and I can scroll down. I'm still going over. There we go. Now I can see the second page begins with my um, um, table of contents, right, that we talked about before. So let me zoom back in so we can actually see what I'm writing. And the bottom of the title page, you want to include a sentence that helps someone get in touch with you if they have a question about your instruction manual. Um, so what we're going to type is, and you see I'm back to bold text, so let's disable that. Questions about this instruction manual may be directed to your name, so I'm going to put Harry Selvin here again, Selvin, via email at your email, and instead of actually spelling out your email address with the at symbol to make it easy for like, you know, um, a web crawler or to, to uh, scrape your email address, uh, we'll put in a space and just write the word at and then um, .cuny.edu and with your email address I guess the uh, domain name is a little bit different if I remember right uh, if that's the case just change this last part of your email address to whatever the last part of your school email address is but now you notice as I went down uh, to the second line it's put me back over to that second page. So I just click in the first page uh, somewhere above that and press delete to get that sentence back to the bottom of the first page, my title page, right? So questions about this instruction manual may be directed to your name via email at and then you give your email address but you don't have to write it out like you normally would an email address by uh, writing space, at space, and then the domain name. Uh, potentially, you may you save you from having your email scraped. Uh, so you don't get a lot of spam. All right, so now we're on the second page. Now, as I uh, alluded to in an earlier lecture, uh, you probably want to, you know, as you began writing your um, document, you would have like this outline the, that I supplied you with or that you modified based on the instruction manuals um, that you looked at um, on the David McMurray online uh, technical writing textbook. Uh, but what we can do, either you can write this over if you've already like began just basically writing all your content in this, uh, or if you had the foresight to, you can duplicate it. Or you can go back to our Open Lab course site and copy my template and just simply paste that in there if you followed these similar uh, sections for your instruction manual. Now, why are we doing that? Well, on this very 
the second page, we want to call this your table of contents. What we're not worried about are page numbers because we're using these section numbers for uh, the se each section and subsection of your instruction manual. And so with table of contents, I'm going to select that text, normal text, and here I'm going to change that to heading one. Okay. And then I'm going to leave as normal text all these section headings for my table of contents. Now, for the table of contents, though, the directions do not need to include these fine points, these sub-subsections under directions, right? That's in the actual instruction manual itself, the content section that you've been writing already. Um, on the table of contents, we can get rid of that. So the table of contents is much leaner. You have 1.0 for introduction, 2.0 description, equipment, etc. Now yours may vary a little bit. That's the reason why I wanted you to look at those other instruction manuals. Uh, but at least you have the, the idea of what this will look like. Now, after I have my outline, my table of contents that shows my section numbering, right, next to each part of my document, after the last one, which should be your reference list, I'm going to just click somewhere down there, or if I still have some of the, the content just below it, I'm going to click right at the beginning of it, and what am I going to, what am I going to do? I'm going to insert, break, page break. And so here's the beginning of my document, right? I've, I've already written some stuff in here. You know, my Norm Ibsen text, right? All that text is written in there. Well, for each of these section headings, we want to change them to reflect the organizational heading size that comes built into Google Docs. We've already done that a little bit. For the title, we set that to title. For the title table of contents, we set that to heading one. And in the subsequent sections of your instruction manual, we want to also set those to the appropriate uh, heading style. So for anything that is a top level, like 1.0, 2.0, those we want to highlight and choose heading one. Now underneath that, we have these other sections, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.4, etc. Well, if 1.0 is heading 1, what do you think these guys are? Maybe heading 2, right? And see, they're all on the same level, 1.2, 1 1.2, 1 1.3. So all those are heading 2. And you'll want to go through your document doing that. And then whatever text appears you know, before each of those sections, you, re you leave that as normal text. This is all normal text within this section, right? But now let's go a little bit further down to the directions, right? And in the directions, you might have, now you don't have to, but you might have these three different levels, right? 4.0, directions. 4.1, assemble the skateboard. 4.1.1 is step one. And then underneath this, like I might have, like let's say 4.2, um, how to ride the skateboard. Maybe I'll give some basic lessons about how how to get on a skateboard and ride it, right? So for this situation, we select the top level heading and change that to heading one for directions. Then the first set of sub-directions in that, assemble the skateboard, that's going to be heading two. And then for step one, 
I'll select that text and choose heading three. And again, whatever falls between that, you know, the actual description of this text, this actual description of what to do in step one is just normal text, like that. And so 4.12, again, that's heading three. Heading three, but now when I get to 4.2, how to ride the skateboard, then I'm going back to heading two. So the size of the heading we use helps the reader understand the hierarchy, the, the organizational structure for your overall document. So again, the table of contents we leave as it is, all normal text, but we have the numbers to help guide us. Now you do see that for the top level headings, the heading ones, I bolded those because I did just want to make them pop. And you can try doing something similar with, with your instruction manual. Um, you could, if you wanted, also change these to the appropriate, uh, actually heading two, right? To the actual headings. But by doing that, it's going to make your table of contents probably spread out over two or three pages. So I recommend for the table of contents, just leave it as normal text so it'll all fit on one page. Then after your table of contents is where everything begins, where, where you're using the headings, heading one for top level, heading two for a subsection, heading three for a sub-subsection, okay? Now, next week I'll show you after you've done this, you've completed writing your instruction manual, you've imported images into the instruction manual, and again, if you have those questions about how to do those types of things with Google Docs, well, that's what Google's there for. I mean, you can find a tremendous amount of information about how to do these things with Google Docs uh, just simply by asking questions on, on Google. Um, and I think I'd mentioned before, um, if I didn't, I'll mention it now. Uh, with a New York Public Library card, uh, you can access um, LinkedIn Learning, what used to be called lynda.com, but LinkedIn Learning with the New York Public Library um, website online. Don't even have to go in the library. Um, and so if... Um, let's open a new browser window, bring it up real quick. Um, LinkedIn Learning, yeah, there we go. If you do a Google search for LinkedIn Learning New York Public Library, it brings you to this site right here. And you click Get Started. And then you log in using your library card number and your PIN number for your library card. And with that, you're able to log in. And what LinkedInLearning.com is, is a tremendous treasure trove of instructional videos, high quality instructional videos no, that normally you'd have to pay a lot of money for, but you get for free with your New York Public Library card. But there's instructional videos on how to become a pro at using Google Drive and Google Docs. Uh, there's videos about becoming a professional user of, of Microsoft Word or an Office 365. Uh, there's videos about how to be a computer programmer, how to be a videographer, how to be a photographer, how to be a film director. Everything is on there. It's really amazing, and it's really cool that with a free library card, you can get free access to LinkedIn Learning. So, again, it's another resource you can use for figuring out how to use some of these digital tools um, in our class. And that's, you know, the ethos of being, you know, a technology student, a engineering student, someone who tries to find solutions to look around um, and allow their curiosity to help guide them to finding uh, resources that can help them solve problems. So with the instruction manual, again, you make sure that you know, the writing is all your own. You may quote and cite things using IEEE style. You know how to use IEEE style from the links I've given you before, uh, the Purdue OWL website, uh, the IEEE 
uh, style manual that uh, was available as a PDF. And of course, we also have David McMurray's online uh, technical writing textbook as a resource uh, for thinking about instruction manuals. Now, next week, I'll show you how to publish this online so that you can share it with your team, get feedback, and then we'll talk about at the week after that, turning it in. Um, so again, this will be overlapped with the team. You're finishing this up when we begin the team-based project next week. Now, just to make sure that you are able to find any resources you might need, especially for like the glossary, that's where you're going to be turning toward those resources you already know how to use from the uh, Expanded Definition Project, how to use dictionaries available through the library's website. Uh, where you can quote them, cite them, again using IEEE style. And just keep in mind, like if you're quoting a lot of stuff throughout your instruction manual, the numbering will be sequential. So, you know, if the, something you quote at the beginning is one, something down here is going to be two, something down here is three, down here four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, however many there are. So, again, make sure you're keeping track of the order of any citations you're doing that you need to include in-text citations for quotes and then in your reference list at the bottom you have a list one two three four five and those numbers correspond to the numbers up above in the instruction manual for each in-text citation of something you quote. Now with that in mind let's go over to uh, the library's website. Just go to library.citytech.cuny.edu. Remember memorize it um, so you just type it in. Don't rely on like you know, a search engine to help guide you there. You know, go directly to the source. Now, here again, on the on the City Tech Libraries website, if you're needing to find some sources that might be relevant to uh, maybe a product like you know, a company's name or the name of a piece of software or product that you're using or a type of device that you're, you're writing instruction manual about, you can find articles and you can also find books that may be relevant. Um, so like for example, uh, to think about an example from my earlier class I recorded. Um, let's say you were writing an instruction manual on how to um, refurbish an original PlayStation. Okay, and you needed to say some things about how the original PlayStation was built. So here in eBooks, I can do a search for PlayStation. These are all eBooks available through the library's website. I can read for free online. And just scrolling through the list, uh, there's this one really great book we have access to called Vintage Game Consoles, an inside look at Apple, Atari, Commodore, Nintendo, and the greatest gaming platforms of all time. I can click on that, and you know, from here I can click on EBSCOhost eBooks CUNY Collection. Now log in, and then on this landing page, um, I can choose to cite it. So I can click cite over here on the right. Scroll down and look for uh, IEEE which they may not have for this particular resource through EBSCOhost. And so what I would have to do then is I have all the bibliographic information right here on the landing page. Title, authors, publication, like the year of publication, the publisher, Rutledge, where it was published. And then I go back to my IEEE style guides that are online, look for one that's relating to an ebook. And then I have all the stuff I need to plug and chug into those models, those examples that they've given us in the style guides. So all that's covered right here. Now to actually read the book, I'm going to click on PDF full text. And what this does is load this reader that's provided by uh, EBSCO to begin reading the book. I can scroll through it just like I'm turning pages. You know, one page, two page, three page, etc. Now, if I wanted to try to like, you know, find exactly what I'm looking for, like say I'm talking about the original Sony PlayStation, why well, don't I turn to the table of contents? So I have this menu on the left I can use. Well, I can see it's organized by generation. Well, I know the Sony PlayStation came out in 1995, so it's not generation one. 
not Generation 2, Generation 3. 1995-2001, I see 3.2 Sony PlayStation. But when I click over here on numbers, nothing happens. So I say Generation 3. Uh, look at uh, this, this hierarchy here. Generation 3, I'm going to expand that. Ah, Sony PlayStation. Click that. Chapter 3.2, I'm here. It gives me some his historical background. Screenshot of Crash Bandicoot. Um, shows some stuff going on there. Um, different screenshots showing examples of, of different games. This is actually from a demo disc. Full screen video. Final Fantasy VII. So some cool stuff that's on here. But I may find something in this writing that I think is relevant, something interesting or useful for my instruction manual. And so like if I wanted to talk about like you know how many had been made, well here I can see that they give some numbers. I could quote this particular sentence uh, to give some sort of numerical backing for saying like the Sony PlayStation was popular because as of March 31st, 2005, Sony had shipped a total of 102.49 million of them. And then I would quote that as a part of my writing, my sentence, give my citation at the end, the in-text citation, make sure I put quotes around what I quoted, and then in my reference list at the bottom, I'm going to have one in brackets, and then my citation for this ebook. So ebooks are one thing that you can use through the library, um, but also you can use the databases. And so if I go back to the library's homepage, find articles over here on the left, and I think I mentioned before going to L and then going to LexisNexis. This is a really great resource for finding um, articles in like newspapers and magazines, but you can also use the A's and Academic Search Complete as well as Academic One File by Gale. So like if I go to Academic One File, just gives me a search box to start off. I can say PlayStation. And you can see it gives me a selection of different types of sources. Now for you know, an instruction manual, I don't necessarily need everything that I'm going to be talking about to be scholarly, you know, things that come from academic journals. I could go to magazines and see what it happens to gear. And it shows me things by relevance, uh, but that may not, it, you know, it's looking at that term PlayStation. And obviously there's been a lot of different versions of the PlayStation updates over time. So I could sort this by, like, say, oldest. And you can see that the way PlayStation gets used, like if you wanted to like look back at our expanded definition project, the way PlayStation gets used in 1993 is completely different than what it means in terms of a Sony PlayStation, because you know Sony PlayStation didn't come out until 1995. So here they're talking about PlayStations and workstations as two different types of use of computers, not something involving Sony PlayStation video game systems. But here when we get to 1994, we're getting closer. So there might be something in here. But this one right here in Billboard, which is also, as you may know, um, a trade periodical for like the music industry. Here they're actually talking about Sony Corp enters video game market interactive 3D unit will have U.S. debut in 95. That might be something cool to find a quote about the debut of the Sony PlayStation in the United States. Um, and be able to quote from that. So I can click on that article. It gives me the whole article here. I can I can look for things I might want to quote. Now, if I want to cite it here, does it give me an option? Ah, top uh, button up here, this icon cite. And again, just like what we saw with the ebook platform, it's not giving us citations in IEEE. But because you have the different listings of how IEEE style should look for a periodical, an article, you can use one of these, like say MLA 9th edition, copy all this information, and then just reformat it 
in your in your reference for number whatever this quote in your instruction manual you can include that reference but then change this information to look the way I triple E should look for a periodical the things we went over when we did the first 500 word summary project and then the expanded definition project you've seen this before now it's a matter of transforming your one type of style into a different one if you're not as familiar with like pulling out all the information you need like the author's name the title title of the publication volume number data publication page number and then where you got it in this case Gale Academic One Gale Academic One file and a link to it now some of this information you won't need in IEEE so you look at the IEEE guide, one of those that I've given you, and look for periodicals. This is a periodical. This is an article that appeared in a periodical, meaning a magazine or newspaper or a scholarly journal. And then put the information here in the format as it should look for IEEE. Things I know that you've done before with like, you know, MLA and English 1101 and 1121, and that you've already done in our class on the earlier projects. Now, depending on your instruction, man, you may or may not need some of this other information, but if you are giving some facts, if you are talking about something that needs to be supported with some evidence, you have to go out into these resources through the library to find the evidence you need to support your claims, okay? Uh, but if it's the parts where you're just giving, like, instructions, do this, do that, do the other, and you're including, like, you know, your images as a part of that, the images are what are supporting the words, the writing of the steps for your directions. And again, remember all the images have to be made by you. Nothing that you find through like, you know, uh, stock images, no public domain images, no Google image search. I, I can't be any more clear. The images have to be made by you or screenshots made by you of the actual process that you're showing people how to do. Um, nothing from like your product images on Amazon, nothing like that. Everything has to be by you. I'm, this isn't an art contest, but I, again, as I've talked about before, you have to show me your intentionality, just the same way you show intentionality with the way you string words together into sentences, okay? All right, so that was a couple of places that you can go looking for additional information that might be beneficial to you. Again, it needs to come through the web, uh, through the library, uh, through these vetted sources. Uh, though the only other exception I'll say, if you're talking about a company and a product, you can also quote from that company's website, the official website. Uh, not from some rando website or a rando YouTube video or something someone said on, on social media. Uh, it needs to be something that's you know, from the company about the product that you happen to be making an instruction manual for or from one of these other resources available through the library. So this week, again, finish this draft of your instruction manual. Next week, I'll show you how to publish it online as a web page. And we will share that with your new team members. And some of the team members you may know, but you may see some new new faces, some new names. Um, I'll send out those emails setting up those teams next week. Okay. Uh, so right now, all I want you to focus on is getting this instruction manual draft done. Um, and then getting it ready for peer review next week. And then next week also, we're going to begin the team-based project uh, full throttle. Okay. So, you know, good luck with finishing up the instruction manual. Um, again, remember, uh, no office hours this week. Um, they just email me if you have any questions or concerns. JLS at citytech.cuny.edu. Um, if you do need to meet about something like emergency, you can set up an alternate office hour meeting. Just send me your availability for the next few days, and we'll find a time to meet. Otherwise, let's save it for office hours Wednesday. 3 to 5 p.m. next week, okay? So, you know, stay healthy. Um, good luck with everything. Oh, one last thing I did, did want to mention to you all. 
if you look on our Open Lab site, this is both on OL68 and OL70. Oh, I actually clicked the right thing. There we go. Uh, I posted this. Uh, I posted this announcement for Plan Week, which is this week. Um, there are opportunities not only to learn about how to create a great plan for finishing up at City Tech for those of you that aren't like graduating seniors. Um, each day there are different videos and uh, these links for responding to what you learn in these videos. Now you can see here that for each day you can be entered in a raffle to win a $50 MasterCard gift card. And then if you participate in all five days, you're entered in for a grand prize of 300 bucks. Um, it doesn't take a lot of time, 20 to 30 minutes per day it says. You know, to watch the video and then take the, um, the survey at the end of the day, at the end of the video. Um, and each and all these videos are still going to be there until the end of the week, until Sunday, November 7th. So like, don't worry if you miss one today, you can do it tomorrow. Uh, and get caught up so you're entered into all the raffles. You'll learn something, but you also get a chance at uh, winning some money may help you out. Um, so you know, consider this uh, as something that, that can be useful um, in multiple ways to you. So you know, take care of yourself, take care of everybody around you, mask up, you know, get your flu shot if you haven't got that yet, especially if you're having to go out and take the train and be around people all the time. Uh, I want to see everybody stay healthy so you can finish the semester um, successfully. You get caught up in all the work in our class. Everything gets graded, and you're going to be happy uh, walking out of our class, not only with a good grade, but also with all these documents that you can make use of in your, in your uh, career later on. So uh, email me if you got questions. Um, everybody take care, and I'll talk to you again real soon.